All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome back, everyone. We're going to get going with week two slides. We're going to be talking about features. So this is our second and last CAD focused lecture. Um, if you guys are in ME1770, you're probably covering the exact same thing in your class right now. Um, however, don't try not to zone out too much. We're going to talk a little bit about robotics applications as we go along. Um, and things might be just a little bit different in Inventor than they are in SolidWorks. Um, but if you're already experienced, you probably already know what you're doing for the most part. So let's dive right in. In week zero, we talked about uh, extrudes, revolves, and then the basic hole feature. Um, and so we're going to be covering a lot of different topics today. We're going to kind of blast through them. Um, and I know that as much as I talk at this screen about all these different features, um, the best way that you can work on these is to practice them with the CAD guides um, and on your own time with different projects that you might be working on. Um, so try to absorb as much as you can, uh, but know that you know sometimes you just need to do things yourself before they really sink in. So first we're going to talk about what makes good CAD. And when we're talking about features and parts, good CAD looks the exact same as they do as the 2D sketches. So when we talk about responsive CAD, it means that whenever we make any kind of change, if we want to make things bigger or smaller, everything else reflects that and it doesn't end up uh, breaking things robust. Uh, and it's also simple. So you don't have a lot, any redundancies um, and things that or features that you create are their own features. You don't try to do too much with, um, with the same command. Uh, and sometimes if you have um, a way to make things way more efficient, like if you have a mirrored CAD, instead of just drawing things twice, sometimes you can literally cut your work in half by using the mirror feature. So the first thing we're going to talk about is work planes. So when you start a sketch for the first time, you've always got the origin planes, the, the three planes that are intersecting. Um, but you can also create planes that are offset from planes and surfaces, or you can create them angled. Uh, and that can help you create new sketches at just the right place or angle that you want. Um, and of course, you can always make things based on the existing geometry. And you can also use work planes as surfaces to mirror over. And as we talk about mirror and other features, this will make more sense. Um, but as is with anything else, as we make changes, we want to make sure that everything that's referencing uh, whatever we're changing is going to uh, function correctly. So to use the plane function, we're going to use this orange plane button. And when you click the drop down, you're going to see a lot of different options. And I'm not going to go through and explain all of them. Usually you can tell what they do just by looking at the little icon and reading um, the description. Uh, but as soon as you select one, then all you have to do is click your reference features, enter in any inputs that it requires, and then you'll have uh, a reference work plane. And so we're going to go show you how to do that. So these are just the three origin planes. Um, and when you click on offset from plane, it's always the first option. Uh, what this example shows is, is selecting the X, Z plane and creating offset of half an inch. And as you can see, you create this work plane that you can now interact with as the same way a normal plane. Super easy, um, super fast, and it can be used to make lofts, which we'll talk about later. Oh, we'll talk about it now. Lofting is when you take two sketches um, and you bring them one together as one solid. These sketches don't necessarily have to be parallel to each other, um, and they don't necessarily have to have the same kind of shape or the same kind of cross section. Um, they can, so like if you want a big square on the bottom and a small square on top and you want to blend them together, that's what a loft is for. Or if you want a circle on top and a square on the bottom and you want to blend them into some kind of weird truncated cone pyramid thing, it can do that too. Uh, you can also use a third sketch that's perpendicular to kind of guide that sketch. So like if you've got a square on the bottom and then a circle off to the side, it doesn't, um, Inventor doesn't necessarily know how to connect those two shapes. So you can create a rail to define exactly what path to follow to get between those two sketches. So this example will show you how to create a simple and complex loft. 
Um, so as you can see, you've got a circle on the bottom, and then this person is creating a circle, um, a little offset on the top. And of course, they're skipping the dimension just for the example purpose, but you always want to fully dimension before you finish the sketch. So you can see they're offset from each other. And all you have to do is click loft, select both, uh, both sketches, and it will automatically show you that blending. And so in this case, it's a truncated cone uh, and really easy to create. So now we're going to delete that and create a rectangle instead. And then same thing. All you have to do is click the loft feature button, select both sketches, and it doesn't matter the order that you select them. If you select the top first, that's fine. And now you can see there's it's got kind of a weird profile, but it still does exactly what you want it to. If you tried doing it with extrusions that go straight up, uh, you're going to have a bad time. Uh, now sweeps are related to lofts, but not quite the same. It's just another way of doing a really complex shape that can't necessarily be done with extrudes. Or, you know, if looking at this part, if you wanted to do this with extrudes, you could, and just a lot of um, fillets, but it would be a really tough time. And so the best way to do it is with a sweep. And so, you know, if you cut a shape and you can see its cross section, all you have to do is take that cross section and sketch it, and then define a path for it to follow. And that path is going to be perpendicular to the cross section. And you'll you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, this can be done for a lot of things. So if you're trying to model PVC pipes or different frames or uh, V-belts, and V-belts you'll be working on in the CAD guide, um, then that's what this is for. So here we'll give you an example. So first, in this example, you're going to see the cross section being made. Um, so in this case, it, it looks very similar to uh, a pipe. Oh, I misspoke. We're creating the path first. It doesn't matter the order as long as both get created. So as you can see, these two arcs are defining just a simple path. Um, as long as there are no sharp corners, then that's all you need. It doesn't need to be a closed profile. In fact, it needs to be open. Oh, no, sorry. It doesn't need to be a closed file. Uh, it can be a full loop. Um, but all you have to do is create a perpendicular sketch with a shape. So in this case, it's a circle, uh, whatever your cross section is. And then you select the profile, the path, and it's done. Um, so I'm going to back it up and just so you can see it again. After creating this path, you just have to create a new sketch and you have to make sure it's perfectly perpendicular to the start of that path. And then you can create a cross section, whatever it is. And then you just create a circle. Use the sweep command. Um, they're selecting the profile, and then they're selecting the curve. And again, you're going to have practice with this in the CAD guide. So if this is kind of hard to understand, um, it'll be easier to go through once you do it yourself. Next, we're going to be talking about shells. So this is something that's great for 3D printing. It helps save on material and save on time. Uh, let's say if you want a lot of infill on the borders, but you don't really want infill on the inside, you can 3D, you can design your part with a hollow inside. And that's how you solve that. Um, you can think like Lego pieces, how they're fully defined on the outside, uh, and that's where all the features need to be. But on the inside, it's completely hollow. And like it's not a, a full face on the bottom, it's um, you, you can you can see on the inside from the bottom. So we're going to see the difference between a total body shell and a face shell. And so for this first example, all you have to do is click the shell button and then define the thickness. And what this is doing is it's totally hollowing out the inside. You can you might be able to see the little red outline. Um, and now to prove it, we're using what's called a half section view. Um, and this is a, a fancy way to show um, the inside of a shape. So you, this is just cutting it in half and showing you on the inside. So you can see it's completely hollow on the inside, and we've defined the wall thickness. 
So now we're going to delete that shell and we're going to show you a face shell. And what this is going to do is the same thing, but now we're deleting the top face as well. So again, all you have to do is just edit the wall thickness. Uh, and this is something you could technically do with um, creating a sketch with a smaller rectangle and then just extrude cutting it down. But um, shelling takes less calculations of where you need to put that rectangle and how far it needs to go. And it also takes care of more complex um, shapes that might not have a fully even inside. Um, so if you think got things jutting out and you still want that wall thickness, that's what the shell is perfect for. Now we're going to talk about fillets and chamfers. We use these a ton, like all the time, and for good reason. Um, part of it is that that's how we machine things. When we machine corners, it's super hard to get a really sharp corner, especially if you're using the water jet or the mill. Um, you can if you really try hard enough, especially with the mill, but um, it's really easy to get these rounded corners or um, in the case of chamfer end mills, you can get these chamfer corners. But we also use them uh, because they're they're good CAD. Um, and we're use and when I say they're good CAD, I'm talking about using fillets and chamfers as a feature. So when you have a sketch open and you're working on a 2D sketch, you'll see that fillets and chamfers are still an option. But we want to avoid doing that while we're in the sketch mode. We want to leave fillets and chamfers to the ends when we're adding features. Um, and what this does is when you're creating dimensions with 2D sketches, um, then it's, it gets really hard when you add in a bunch of unnecessary uh, rounded shapes. And when you do it at the ends as features, then those dimensions can still be easier to change uh, later on when you just edit the sketches themselves. Uh, and also, fillets don't necessarily have to be the same throughout your full edge. And I'll show you example uh, slides later. But like if you're doing something similar to an airplane wing, um, you can see that the, the fillet is pretty small towards the edge of the wing, but gets more rounded as it gets closer to the full body of the plane. So as you can see, fillets can help also create more complex geometries. And then the other ap practical application of fillets and chamfers is it's really great for stress distribution. Uh, I think I was mentioning uh, a little while ago or in a previous training that sharp corners are pretty bad as far as stress distribution goes. Um, if you put in a fillet on the, on the inside or on the outside of a sharp corner, it helps um, keep things a little stronger. Um, it's better for 3D printing for the same reason. And you know, it, it looks better. And there's nothing wrong with things looking better. And we have already talked about machining things. So just to show you what I mean when I'm talking about fillets and chamfers, all you have to do is click the fillet feature and then select an edge that you want to fill it uh, and just change the radius. And you can make it bigger or small. Uh, face fillet is kind of the uh, a little bit different. It's when you have two faces that are really close together and you want to round them out. And this can actually kind of um, blends these faces together, which if that's what you're looking for, then it, it works really great. Um, but if you make the fillets smaller, then you can probably blend it back into uh, the shape that you want. So like if you wanted fillet, small fillets on the inside without blending these together, you can still do that. And then full round. So if this used to be a cube, but I made the fillet so big and using um, what's called a full round, so that it turns it into a full arch. So I'm changing the geometry a lot, um, which again, if that's what you're looking for, that's great. But sometimes with the measurements, things can get, things can get a little awkward and um, hard to math out. And then chamfers are pretty much the same thing, except we're now dealing with angles instead of fully round edges. So the default is just a 45 degree um, miter, I think is the word for it. Uh, but you can also change the, uh, the degree that you create this chamfer. 
Now we're going to talk about the whole tool. Whole tools are also something that we use a ton in robotics. Because every time you want to create a hole in a part, you don't necessarily want to start a sketch, create a circle, and then extrude it down. Sometimes we want to add threads. And sometimes we want to add counterbores or anything like that. Um, and the whole tool is perfect for it. So instead of using a circle to specify where we want to put the hole, we're going to use the point. So when you create a sketch, a point is one of the things you can make, just like a line uh, or any other feature or any other sketching tool. So when you select your points, you're going to have a lot of options with the whole feature. And so um, this is a clearance hole, and you might be using this a lot. This is just a generic uh, hole as if you extruded down a circle. Um, but then there's a tapped hole. So you can see these lines show that uh, there's going to be a thread on the inside. You can specify the exact kind of thread, um, and it gets super specific. So if you have a super specific screw that you need, this can fill out everything you need. Uh, and even if you aren't going to be 3D printing or necessarily machining in these threads, um, it can be useful for the CAD just to have a documentation of what you're going to be using. You can also change the diameter of what your hole is going to be, how deep this thread is going to be, how far it goes, anything like that. So, like I said, um, yeah, we use this a lot, and um, it's it's really easy once you figure out how to use it. So just giving you a little demo. So you got to start by creating a sketch, and then right below, right next to rectangle, you can see the point. And so it's hard to see the points once they place them, um, but these can be dimensioned just like everything else. Um, so when you click the hole, it will automatically select every point that you put down. And so we're creating a clearance hole, and we're changing how far down it goes, and then we're changing the diameter. And just like everything else, it's really easy to select these input boxes, make sure they're everything we want. And as soon as we're done, we can hit OK. Uh, I think this is the last thing we're going to be talking about, projecting geometry. Um, this is something we kind of referenced in week zero. Projecting geometry is when we take something, take a reference geometry. So like, let's say we're doing um, a sketch. Or actually, I'll use this cup. Say I'm, I'm trying to make a cup here. So the, the top diameter is bigger than the bottom diameter. But let's say I'm doing a sketch on this top, and I want to make um, something that's exactly the same diameter as the bottom. What I can use is projecting geometry. So um, when I'm in a sketch and I click Project Geometry, I can then select um, any geometry that's in this part. So if you're looking down at this, I don't want to show you because it's still got stuff in it. Um, just top. Yeah, what is it? Talking milk. Anyway, um, if I select the what looks like the bottom of this cup, then it will uh, project the yellow line. Oh shoot, is my video not working? Oh my gosh. All right, we're back. If I select the bottom of this cup, then it's going to project a yellow outline right up to my sketch. And then I can then reference it for anything that I need. Uh, it's super useful when working on um, different assemblies that are you know, top down. So if we're looking at something and we want to reference stuff that's below our sketch, that's what it's for. So we're going to show you it here. We can create a rectangle. We're just, I think we're just creating some reference geometry. So 
It's a nice little robot face. By the way, when you start to sketch on a plane, you sometimes have to click to like the very edge or the corner of it. So yeah, the project geometry button is right there. And it's hard to see, but when you click on something, it turns into a yellow outline. And now when you look at it from the isometric view, you can see that things have projected straight up onto your plane. Oh, this, is, this is the last thing, mirrors and patterns. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. If you've got some a shape that you want to do, um, then you can just mirror it straight over. So the mirror tool can be used in both a sketch and as a feature. Um, so I think in this example, we're going to be just doing it within the sketch. And so if you're within a sketch, all you need is a mirror line. And then if you're in 3D, then what you need is a mirror plane. Oh, this is the <laughs> this is the sweep. I think there's an error there. I should talk to Malik about that. Um, anyway, this is something that I think you'll probably get practice with plenty in the future. Uh, it can literally cut your work in half, as I said earlier. Uh, but patterns are similar, where they can cut your work really simply. So let's say. Um, I've got a hole that I want to uh, put place evenly around a shape. So like, let's say, I don't know, a gear that we're using from RoboCup, like in a CAD guide, um, we can create a simple hole. And then by just referencing the hole and then an axis of rotation, uh, we can, yep, just like they're doing in this example, we can then define how many we want evenly displaced or evenly placed, and then the angle that we want them evenly placed around. And all of a sudden, it places that for us. And uh, just like mirrors, it's something you can do within a sketch, and it's something you can do as a feature. Um, it's very handy, and you're going to be able to use it in the CAD guide. You can also use uh, rectangular patterns, which I think are less common, but are still useful. So now, I hope you guys are paying attention because it's Kahoot time. Yay, Kahoot time. You guys can't hear this, can you? That means I can listen to my favorite. I had a friend last year who would play um, Kahoot plus the Kahoot music plus Sweet Dreams. Uh, it was a really weird mashup. But it works. How many people do we have? We got 22, I think. Yep, seems good. Can I really not share my audio? Hmm. Not on Teams, but if it was Sad. Discord, we definitely could. All right, I'm going to give it. 10 more seconds, because I think some people just left. <laughs> All right. 
Oh. Oh, according to Google, I can share audio. I'll figure that out for next time. All right, well, let's get started. All right, what is easier to make with a mill? Okay, so um, I probably should have specified external chamfer, but when you think about an external fillet, um, trying to see if I have an example in my room. So an internal fillet, it's really easy to cut on the inside. Oh, yeah, yeah. So an external fillet like that, you have to be really careful with the mill. Um, it's it would be super hard to to get that perfect round on the outside. It's it's easy on the inside because the tool itself is round, uh, and you have to end up with a fillet. But with a chamfer, you just have to go straight across, and the cut ends up being at an angle. That's a tough one. Ooh. Clearance or taps? What's wider? All right, cool. So clearance by the name, it goes straight through. There's, there's nothing in the middle. Um, it's meant for things to be straight through. Uh, tapped means it's threaded, so it's got to have uh, a very specific diameter. All right. What operation would you use? Okay, full round. Um, I don't think face fillet is a thing. I think there's just edge fillets. Uh, oh, no, 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 I talked about face fillets, Never mind. Face fillets would be if you've got two surfaces and then you wanted to fill in the gap with a round. Full round is when you um, encompass multiple edges. All right, still shuffling around a little bit. Best order for basic operations. All right. Oh, so. For the sweep loft loft people, I'm guessing it was probably because you wanted to do sweep and then you could loft at one end, loft at the other end. Um, it's always easier to start at one end and just work your way around. Um, though I guess you could, but for the purpose of this question, orange is correct. All right, so we're talking about external fillets. Ooh, wow. OK, so with the end mill, that's what we were talking about with the first question. It's really easy to get internal fillets, but really hard to get external fillets um, because the ball end mill itself is round. With the water jet, you can get super precise um, cuts with anything. Um, so for an external fillet, you'd use a water jet. Um, I guess we didn't really talk about water jets much. Essentially, um, 
think of it as like a laser cutter, but way faster. And uh, it cuts all the way through instead of being able to engrave stuff. Um, so we can pretty much just throw in a, a, a 2D cutting file and it'll follow that path perfectly. Waterjet is super cool. If you get a chance to use it, do it. Ball end mill. Here, I'll show you a picture. So it's called a ball end mill because it looks like it has um, kind of a ball at the end of it. So because this is it, it spins like a drill does. So when it's spinning and cutting down, um, when it cuts into a shape and then turns to make a corner, try to imagine what kind of corner that would make. Um, because this drill, or just because the ball end mill itself is round, it can't make a sharp corner. It can't get to that precise 90 degree angle. It'll make it overall, but it can't make the corner itself. All right. Oh, fire alarm. Yikes. Stay safe. All right. Least important aspect to consider. We're not saying this isn't important. We're saying it's the least important. OK. Someone's saying, wait, wait, wait in the chat. What's up? Oh, I mean, it, it is important. But if you're choosing looking good versus stuff breaking when you try to change something, I, I, think, I think we want robustness more. But yes, I agree. Aesthetic is super important. We, we love aesthetic. But it's just not the most important. All right, CAD tool for an internal feature. All right. Um, I'm going to guess the green was a misclick. If you wanted to use a loft cut, you could. But um, yeah, shell is the most efficient way to do it. What shell option would you use? Yeah, so I mentioned this briefly. Let's see if you guys caught it. OK, so I mentioned face shells and body shells. So body shell would be if the thing was um, hollow on the inside. And my video stops working. Love that. Um, so I'm going to go back over to the lecture here. Um, So it's when the inside is hollowed out without any of the faces being deleted versus a face shell when you delete the top face um, while hollowing out the inside. And so when you look at these bowls, because there's no lid to the bowl, uh, we're, we're doing a face shell. All right, what is not a necessary reason to use fillets?
All right. Um, so eliminating sharp edges and reducing stress concentration, that's why we use them um, for, the, for the most part. Um, you know, like when, when you handle stuff on your robot, it would be really bad if you grabbed something and it had a really sharp edge. Uh, so when you round things out, it makes it easier to grip. Um, yeah, so again, aesthetics is, is important and great to have, but it's not the necessary reason. How many 2D sketches do you need for a sweep? All right. Yeah, so when you have one per uh, perpendicular to the other, then you can create your profile and then your, your path. And so that has to be perpendicular. All right, let's see how it ended up. Mm, all right. Congrats, Steve, if that is your real name. <laughs> so nines out of tens, okay. So I'll try to revise these questions a little bit in the future, but um, great. So congrats, guys. Um, we're gonna now transition a little bit into the CAD guide. So first, for anyone who showed up after I initially sent out this link, I'm going to send it again. Um, if I can copy this correctly. We're going to send out this link. Basically, what this says is, hey, are you doing these CAD guides? We're just looking for a response. Or we're just looking for feedback. Now, it's totally anonymous. So um, you know, be honest. We're just trying to make sure. We're just trying to see if what we're putting out with these CAD guides is being effective. And if there's any way that we can make it better so that um, you guys can get the practice that you need. You guys will probably get a lot of practice when you do your own work with your own RoboDacus teams. But we're putting out these CAD guides because we genuinely think they're good practice. Um, and so, like I said earlier, this is the last CAD-focused lecture, which means that all the CAD stuff is going to sprinkle, be sprinkled throughout the other lectures and then but mostly focused in the CAD guides. So uh, I really hope you guys focus on that and I'll go ahead and also send out this CAD guide doc. Um, but yeah. Uh